So I've brought Brian Wang back on today because I am going to be playing in territory that is above my pay grade. I mean, if you look up above my pay grade in the dictionary, you'll find my picture <laughs> related to the subject matter that we're going to be covering today. But I know that Brian Wang, at least, is uh, somebody who is very uh, clearly educated and uh, has experience in this area. So, Brian, uh, glad to have you on board today. Glad to be here, Randy. All right. So if you like having Brian on, you know what to do. I don't have to tell you anymore. You know, I'm sure you'll see some notifications uh, in terms of, uh, you know, joining Patreon, following Brian over on his Patreon. He's easy to find everything. Everything is under my, uh, next, next big, big, big future. future. <laughs> next big next, future. Next, next big future. So look for Brian on Twitter, on his, on his uh, website in particular. That's really what he's... Uh, got going right now this is his big website huge website okay okay so so there are methods uh and again a quick bit of research there are methods like how you stack the uh computers whether you face them close cl face to face or something i didn't fully understand why all that would matter you've got water instead of air um as your cooling method but mm -hmm. You, but talk to us a little bit about. But, but I think if, if if your application, you know, was stressing things that much, in general, you would have gone to the most efficient thing there anyway. Oh, right. Okay. You know, because you know, like if I'm running my Cray Exaflop supercomputer or something like that, you know, I the the fact that I need to have a you know 30, 50, 100 mega megawatt power thing, right, one tenth of a nuclear power plant, right. right. I'm I'm paying that every year. So the fact I pay a billion dollars for the machine and then I'm paying, you know, $50 million, $100 million on, on running costs, you know, the electricity, the, the air conditioning and, and the, the water cooling, all that stuff. So if I can shave off my operating cost by half, I'm highly motivated to spend $50 million, $100 million to, right. to do that. Right. right. So uh, and then if I'm running a big data center, Google, data center, again, the uh, they're already economically driven to be very efficient. They're not like throwing that stuff away because, you know, $10 million a year or something like that, if I, if I, you know, or $50 million a year, if I can shave $10 million off, the team is motivated to do that. Sure. Right. So, so what about these other ones though, apparently? So I don't understand at all about the superconductivity. Is that within the computers themselves? Is this something that would allow the electrons within the actual uh cpu or no not cpu i see what i i see what i don't yeah, know <laughs> yeah so so um supercomputers ha uh superconducting has been around for a while um we, we've had you know the nobium metal and the other metal ones that have to be cooled down to you know like liquid uh hydrogen helium whatever type temperature you know four to five degrees uh above zero and then there's a less uh, stringent ones that you know can be cooled by liquid nitrogen which makes it you know 100 times cheaper to do that but you know like still this is like way beyond the cost of um of uh water cooling regular water cooling right sure. nitrogen is different sure. um so that's what we did for a while the latest news which has been out for the last week or so is that um south koreans say they've come up with um room temperature superconductors so right. this is this is the buzzword. Room this is the buzzword. Which are super conducting. Okay. Right, right. And I've been all over this, following okay. this closely. Right. Okay. So um there have been other people who said I've done I got room temperature superconducting, right? The the hitch with those other ones was they needed diamond anvils, not just regular diamond anvil, billion time pressure. And look, I, I it's room temperature, but it's a billion times the pressure. You've substituted one problem for this other insane problem, right? And so it's just, it's just not practical, right? Whether it worked or not. And then there was the issue of whether it worked or not. There was some controversies about what's some fake data and something like that. And they had something under pressure and oh, the room temperature. Oh, I lost it. I had this tiny speck of something and then it, it floated away. You know, the, the anvils let it go or something like that. Anyway, so so that was the, the, the big thing was that could you get it practical away from but you know they had used the other slightly less practical thing because it's still useful uh -huh. because they can save so much energy and power, so that the the, the New York Navy spent a bunch of you know money to make a thirty six um, megawatt um, um, reactor for running their um, 
uh, and turbines and stuff for running their like aircraft carriers and shit. Um, so, uh, so they um, were able to make that one third smaller. Ah. So, so you can, by going to superconductor, even if you had add, add the extra cooling in, you can shrink stuff down. Anything electrical, a lot of power systems and stuff from, you know, computing to, you know, uh, electric engines to other stuff like that. But you need to have the right thing. You need to have superconductors not just, you know, solve whatever temperature it is and be able to cool at that temperature, but have the current and the and the magnetic fields work so you can get it to the thing. So all these things are different. For computing and for quantum computing, they're generally using nobium uh so not the the one discovered a few decades ago, the one discovered before that, and they use Josephson junctions. So instead of a transistor, it's a Josephson junction, and that thing is like a thousand times more energy efficient. And they use and they mil make them by the millions on chip for these things, for quantum computers and for the application where I need this thing blazingly fast, right? Blazingly fast, like our laptops, what four gig gigahertz. Right, been stuck there for like 20 some years, right? 20, 30 years. We've been stuck at four gigahertz. You might be able to get to 4.5, you're, you're, you're stuck there four gigahertz. These superconducting chips, they can go to like 800 gigahertz. They can go to like terahertz and stuff like that. So I don't have to do, before I had to go like a bunch of stuff in parallel, you know, 40 different cores, 64 different cores. I'm running things in parallel because I can't get faster than four gigahertz. Now I can have one core that runs at 800 gigahertz and does the, the power of 20 straight up and maybe even more because I don't have the efficiency, inefficiency of like chunking up my problem and spreading out among 20 different things. I can just like one thing blatantly fast, 800 gigahertz. So a yeah. hundred times more powerful, a thousand times uh, lower power. They're using this for the no beam chips. They gave University of Rochester, USC, $15 million to, to work out this for, for their defense military computing thing. So, from this old way they can do it. But now if we get room temperature superconductors, better superconductors, which will take a few years to sort of, even though um, th they seem to be able to do it with like regular lab equipment, you wow. know, stuff like at, a, at a, an undergraduate lab, which is why the replication happened within a week where they got this like little slivers, uh, paint chip size things floating above magnets, which was a classic thing of like, is it a superconductor? Is it floating above this other magnet? Although there's, diamagnetic and paramagnetic which can kind of float they don't float as well as superconductors which are perfect diamagnets anyway if this thing happens and it seems like the thin film version of stuff works even better than other stuff then computing will change and the other reason that i'm highly confident that if the thing's proven for real and there's various theoretical confirmations from uh, berkeley labs national labs china labs something like that the theory stuff is starting to pan out Although people still think don't count your, you know, chicken before they're hatched kind of thing. The reason I'm highly confident about this thing is that they're putting copper ions or it could gold or silver ions in the exact spot, which is like, this is called doping. I put a few atoms into something where I want it to be in order to perform, make it work better. Semiconductor industry, hundreds of billions of dollars, they're doping and putting molecules exactly where they want all the live long day, right? So this thing is like, oh, if you say all I have to do is dope this thing with copper, and then I can get a hundred times faster, a thousand times cheaper, we're good. Let's let's do it. Run that into the the uh, the TSMC uh, fab. Let's uh, get the lines running and blah blah blah. So, you know, not super fast. You know, it still takes time to get this stuff to happen. But you know, two years, three years, we could be getting these super chips. And the volume, like the the difficulty of doing it in small volume smaller batches of course is easier and then to scale up right but the driving force for the trillion dollar semiconductor industry to say master superconductors do it at scale make everything 100 times faster make everything a thousand times less energy right and with the thousand times less energy thing means i can do 100 times more compute and i'm still 10 percent of the energy because i'm a thousand times more efficient on yeah. energy right yeah. and then we know we're spending like um 3% of our, you know, national grid, maybe like 10, 20% of our national grid on this stuff. So the motivation is I don't have to build a hundred nuclear reactors in the United States and I get all this stuff. Yay. <laughs> right. Because that, that would take 
a nuclear reactor, $20 billion, you know, 10 years to make or something like that, that's for one. And I got to make a hundred of them, right? That's like a trillion dollars, right? So the motivation to convert this thing and get super efficient, it would be very strong. And it's like right up their alley, make something molecularly precise and dump some ions right where you need them to be. And then the other thing would be then if it's difficult to get it to, to bulk scale for the, you know, really big magnet for those big, um, um, for the big, uh, uh, you know, aircraft carriers and stuff like that for the Navy. And then you have like a hundred ton magnet or something like that. Right. And you'd have something, you know, big, uh, you know, different sizes, you know, but something huge. And for like all the Tesla vehicles, okay. It'd be great if I could have a, a superconducting magnet instead of a regular magnet there, I could get more power and all this kind of stuff, but I need to, uh, make, you know, maybe a kilogram for every vehicle. Right. So yeah. I got a million vehicles. I got to make a thousand tons. Yeah. Right. So, and then the value is, okay, I get a little bit more efficiency versus I am a hundred times faster on the semiconductor. So the compute applications come first just because I need less and I get more out of it. And then it'll trickle down to these other things, but you know, there'll be this trillion dollar industry driving the mastering of it. And then they'll make layers. Okay. If I can do one layer, I can do like a hundred layers and I can make more and more a bigger and bigger thing. Right. So then it'll go to things like space applications satellite applications, something where if I can make this 10 times better, instead of going to Mars in six months, I go to Mars in a month. I see. So, I so see. who wants that? Who wants to pay a <laughs> hundred million dollars or a billion dollars for a special, you know, engine that can take me, you know, to Mars, you know, using a magnetohydrodynamic drive or something like that, which has been around for 60 years, but just didn't have the power. And then now I have spent a billion dollars to make this freaking engine so I can go to Mars in a month. Oh, Elon, you want that? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Duh. <laughs> okay, here, billion dollars. Oh, you do have billion dollars. Fantastic. So then we can make a bunch of those kind of special face But you do that before you do, you know, certain other bulk applications where like, I need a freaking 10 million tons of this stuff. I need 100 million tons of this stuff, right? So that comes later. So it's, it's a, how fast can I make a bunch of this stuff? How much benefit do I get? I get the most from the compute stuff. Next will be certain space applications, certain aerospace applications, stuff where I need, I'm willing to pay a lot for this, you know, a little bit of the, of the unobtainium, like the, the avatar, oh, right, right. Room, which is basically was room temperature semiconductor. The yeah. unobtainium was that. So now we're going to get obtainium. We're going to get it. It's just like, how much we get, when, how good is it? What are the, the parameters around it? So, and, and what you're saying is that you dug deep on this and you think that what the South Koreans are showing looks like it's the real, because we get how many, you know, different things every single day of stuff that's done in the lab, but it can't be done uh, to scale. You're feeling like this looks like the real thing. So last night, Berkeley Labs, you know, the, you know, we have a four or five national labs, right? Berkeley Labs, they ran the six hour um, on the simulation on their supercomputers and they say, yeah, this probably works. Right. Wow. So they did it with, um, you know, um, the, you know, DFT, whatever calculations. So not definitive, not conclusive. You'd need to run it with phone on and blah, blah, blah calculations. But you know, the first cut seems to work, seems to work. And then Shenyang labs in China, the Chinese national lab in Shenyang, they also work from first principles and published papers saying, yeah, we think it's going to work too, based on first principles. And then we'll think it work even better with uh, silver and gold instead of copper. Right. So the theoretical side is lining up and then three or four, um, videos showing them doing that floating magnet little piece of material, two or three from China, one from an amusing person on the, on Twitter. Um, Iris Alexander, who has a um, uh, cat girl anime logo on her thing, and she's uh, sounds a bit nuts, but apparently a fantastic chemist. And the fact that you know her stuff work, you know, aligned with what other people are doing, seemed to me that she didn't uh, fake it. Um, so, so, what, so what's the, so what's the business side of this? Other than the fact that it would be great for society, what's the business side? Is this is this a patentable process? Is this something that once we know that it can be done. There'll be 15 ways to do it. So it won't be patentable. Um, is this something? There'll be, there'll be thousands, tens of thousands of patents. There'll be um, 
Nobel Prizes up the yin yang. Um, it'll be we will it'll be like we go from the age of uh, beginning electricity to the age of uh, superconducting electricity and superconducting power. It's like it's a phase shift for for our world. It's like all the stuff that you know. So it's like um, going from steam engines and blah blah blah, and then Edison comes along with electricity and stuff like that. And you had previously had you know whale oil things, and now we're going to the next level. It's like next level tech in many many things. All right. So the, does that mean the South Korean company is? got it and they're that's theirs and they're going to be the ones that are going to get all the benefit that's kind of what i'm asking no are, it's one of those things where somebody else is going to get get around their patent easily because there's so many ways to attack the problem or yeah there'll be um classes of superconductors this is there's like um like i said the chinese race thing we substitute uh, silver and gold right so that wasn't in the original um uh, papers or the well although the south korean patent did try to say you know many different kinds of materials so they did get a patent that did that right they said many different kinds of materials but <clears throat> for patent law one patent like that for something this important you're not gonna get support and, and also the kind of thing of like china's gonna say blah 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 patent <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> you know or i can make my economy 10 times bigger yeah. right yeah but how much is that patent gonna hold up yeah yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so they'll have some, and yeah. they'll, and they'll also the eighteen year thing, you know, no extensions for you, and then any way we can wire down that patent, we will, and then we'll have all our own patents, and then it'll be like, you know, like you know, when IBM comes along, and you know, can they have all these compute patents? It's like I have my patent war chest, you have your patent war chest, and we you have to swap in order to get something done, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they'll be uh, swapping rights to patent, and they'll build building a patent pool. And then, you know, the theory guys had, had done the math, but it's like, fine, you got the start. But then, you know, just like the the CRISPR um, yeah. DNA thing, right? You know, three different groups, you know, did the work. And then, you know, they, you know, each of patents, you know, so it's it'll be a complicated situation, but it won't be in no way will it be a showstopper. So this is not legal advice. This is <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I, I have a law degree, but I haven't passed the bar. So this is not legal advice. All right. Um, as always, amazing to have you on board and mm -hmm. uh, help me with all this stuff that is above my pay grade. And now I feel like I've had a you know graduate level course. So okay. <laughs> it's all good. All right. right. So Thank you. Again. Yeah. And then uh, hit like if you liked it. So we get uh, Brian back often. And then uh, subscribe, notify, all that stuff, and uh, follow Brian. Next Big Future. He's everywhere, right. especially you want to go to nextbigfuture.com. That's the main place he'd like you to visit and check out what he's doing over there. Thanks again, Brian. Thank you, Randy. And to all of you out there, it's been great talking to you. Click the link below to get your paperback, Kindle, or audiobook now.